So today, check your tickets. You have signed up for working through the subdivision and site plan approvals. I'm Stephanie Verdial. I am a principal planner here with the Office of Planning and Development. And with me today is um, assistant planner Alvina Snagach and principal planner Noah Hodgetts. They'll be helping us with the technical difficulties as well as keeping track of questions. So today I'm going to talk, um, just kind of review the process in general for site plans and subdivision applications, focusing again with the planning board members. I'm going to review the applicable laws um, that, that gives the planning board the review and approval authority, um, your regulations, your forms, your checklists, waivers, deadlines, yes, yes, yes to all of the above. Um, your application types, your major and minor. Um, the meeting and um, application management for this for land use staff and for the board. And this is also geared for um, those the, the municipalities that don't have land use staff um, that with that board member is the is the person who is in charge of taking in applications. We're going to work on um, motions, how to accept, not to accept um, site walks. Yes. Third party review. Yes. Um, do a little bit of discussion about board decisions, what's final or not, um, wrapping it up with some tips for board members, and then we're going into our Q&A. So again, welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience and thank you for cooperating with us by having your, your cameras and your microphones turned off. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. You're going to use your chat actually right away at the beginning. I'm going to throw a quiz your way. I'm going to see how many people know or are familiar uh, with the land use laws that they work with as a planning board member. So the first one, throw it in the chat. What is the RSA that creates planning boards? Just jump right in there if you think you know the answer. We'll give a couple of minutes. Noah, how many how many do we have in the chat? Uh, we have four or five people. They're all saying RSA 674. I haven't seen anybody actually uh, quote the section of the subsection of 674. Okay. So this is for what is the RSA for creating the planning board? I'll give you another 10, 15 ish seconds here. And I've for those of you that have your white books this year, you should be furiously switching ahead to RSA. Let me get to the right page myself. It is the final answer, RSA 673-1. That is the creation and establishment of local land use boards. And for those of you who are just joining, please make sure that your camera is off. Uh, it's the top of your screen. There's a line through the camera. And the election of officers, next RSA. What is the RSA that governs the elections of officers? Anyone knowing what elections of officers are frantically looking through? Elections of officers is 673-8. A set of creating bylaws. Now that you have you've authorized a planning board, you've elected officers. Now it's time to look at your bylaws. What is the RSA for creating bylaws? Okay, we have somebody saying 673.9, and another one says 673.2. Okay, this is good practice, and appreciate everyone participating. It's kind of hard to do virtually, but I thought this would be a new, a new twist on things and kind of fun to get you to dive into these RSAs. So a few more coming in. Okay, the RSA. For bylaws is 676-1. 676-1 is the RSA. Uh, 
What is the RSA for the adoption of the master plan? Anyone know that one? I'll give you a hint. It's in the 674s if you're looking it up in, in your in your law book. Give it a few more seconds here. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? Okay, very good. I see some 674 ones, some 674 ones and twos. Very good. Megan, Rich, uh, who else? Kimberly. Okay, very good. You're getting your got your master plan right. Uh, then if the community chooses to do so, what is the RSA for adoption of a zoning ordinance? Zoning ordinance. Good idea, no, thanks. It's kind of an open book test. <laughs> Adoption of a zoning ordinance. I'd say what a 674-18. Yep, 674-18 is part of them. The zoning ordinance are 674-16 through 20 is adoption of zoning ordinance. So very good, who had that? Uh, subdivision regulations. What is the RSA for adopting subdivision regulations? As planning board members, you should have that right at the tip of your tongue, ready to jump in with your answer. Subdivision regulations. There we go. We okay. have somebody who I think nailed it. Uh, yep, I have somebody. Andrew, uh, 674, Andrew. 36. Yep, 35 and 36. So we had uh, Rich come in and Andrew. Yep, very good. Okay, good answers, you guys. So now moving on to site plan regulations. What are the RSA that authorizes the planning board to have review and approval authority over site plan regulations? Give you a hint. We're still in the 674s. Okay, it looks like Judy was the first one to the finish line there. Judy Bibbins, 674, 43 and 44. Very good. Good job, Rich, Julie, Stephanie, very good. Okay, and did I get them all? Oh, wait a minute, Zoning Board of Adjustment. Sorry, I missed that. So if you have a zoning ordinance, you have to have a Zoning Board of Adjustment. So what is the RSA? Sorry, backing up a little bit. What is the RSA for the creation of a Municipal Zoning Board? That is what is required if you have a zoning ordinance. Kind of a not well-known one, but it's still in the land use RSAs. Anyone have? Okay, wait a minute. Looks like we have Kimberly 673-1. Yep, 673. Very good. Okay. Good job, you guys, for a little bit of a different twist here on um, working with our land use statutes. So we talked about subdivision regulations. Everybody now knows it's 674-36. So subdivision regulations must be consistent with the goals of the master plan as well as or, uh, the zoning ordinance, of, specifically when you're talking about location for housing. Um, when you've got the zoning ordinance, what's allowed in what zone, your subdivision regulations should complement that. Um, the subdivisions, according to the RSAs, uh, they may address um, services, your street um, layout, utilities, public health, your lot configuration, um, and they should also include um, what makes a completed application. Um, what is the requirements for me as an applicant to come to you with the application? What do you need for me to make the application complete? So that should all be outlined in your subdivision regulations, which then is transferred to your application, which is then transferred as well to your checklist. So all three of those, the subdivision and site plan, but for subdivision regulations, you need your application form and your checklists. Those are adopted and included as part of your regulations. And when you want to make changes to your applications and to your checklist forms, those have to be done in a public hearing because they're part of your regulations. Um, they also describe your thresholds for major and minor um, subdivisions, what constitute that, what the, what's requirements, what the size is, all of those things are spelled out in your regulations, which and then your application and your checklist follow suit. They all should complement each other. And like I'm sure all of you know from attending all of our trainings and conferences, um, when you have regulations, you have to have some type of relief from that. 
and for the planning board for subdivision and for site plan regulations, but you need to have what is a waiver. Okay, so waivers are the legislative relief um, for your regulations. What a variance is to the zoning ordinance, which the zoning board addresses and takes care of, the planning board has the waivers of their regulations. It's the same premise to give relief to a re regulation. Um, and subdivisions are, you know, their, their main goal and purpose is to, I'm, I'm sure as planning board members, you've heard this term, it's scattered and premature development. Well, what that means is that each subdivision addition to a town um, should be included as part of the community of that town. So that means that where the, that can connect efficiently with the existing community. So a scattered and premature development proposal would be one that could be way considered one that's way on the outskirts of town, where there's no septic, there's no um, public utilities, it's difficult for buses, it's far away from the police station, it's far away from the fire station. All of that's scattered and premature, meaning it's it's far away and that area may not be ready yet for development. That's what that premature means. So those are basis, which you, again, you always hear me say, consult with your town attorney, but scattered and premature is something that a board can discuss and determine whether or not an application meets that or it doesn't, which can be the basis of an approval or a denial. So just some basic kind of understandings of where we get these terms, why we have them, um, instead of just throwing around, oh, it's scattered and premature. Well, there, there are conditions that the board needs to look at and review. And that's based on your regulations, based on street layout, based on utility access, based on public service access. They, they all come together uh, to help you with your decisions and should be spelled out in your regulations. And again, just as a little reminder, um, the adoption of your amendments, um, any kind of changes that you make to your subdivision or site plan uh, regulations, um, can be done at a public hearing um, with a 10 day notice. So then now let's look at your site plan regulations. Just like for subdivision, um, the site plan regulations are spelled out in the RSAs, 674-43. Um, the, site, the site plan regulations are a little different as they have a must and a may inclusion. So site plan regulations must include your procedures, uh, their purpose, you have a statement of purpose at the beginning of your regulations, um, sections for performance guarantees, uh, as far as you know what's required for bonding and for engineering, things like that. Um, and again, they must um, provide waivers. Again, you have a regulation, you've got to legally provide relief for that, and you can set up the standards for for waivers. I'll talk a little bit more about waivers, but this is just a basic to you know what your or your ordinances should be including. Uh, site plan regulations are in, in designed to ensure that permitted uses through the zoning ordinance are constructed and operated in a way that they fit into the area in which they're being constructed, where the zoning ordinance allows them. The zoning ordinance allows Dunkin' Donuts here. So the site plan regulations are geared for development in that area. And the main purpose is to make sure that development of that area where that Dunkin' Donuts is allowed um, it's not going to cause undue um, strain to the municipal services. There's drainage, there's traffic, you know, intersections, all kinds of things, egress, ingress, all those types of things. The site plan regulation addresses to where a use is allowed. And that's for commercial, for industrial, for mixed uses could be done in the site plan regulations as well. Uh, change of use, those types of things, uh, multifamily development are all types of things that are in your site plan regulations that also, again, site plan and subdivision regulations should complement other ordinances, the goals of the master plan and the zoning ordinance. So as a planning board, we all know that your number one role pretty much, uh, I guess, is to review applications. So um, make sure that you have enough time and legally you, you can say you need more time to review this application. So application submitted to the planning board is according to your board and meeting schedule, which I recommend that you do like in a year in advance. You set up your meeting dates, you set up your deadline dates, um, put that out in a year. You have them done in, you know, end of the year, you know, November, October, November, December of 24. You should have your meeting dates up and ready for 25. 
and that means to be a minimum of 21 days prior to your, when your, your public hearing dates are. Again, as we're reviewing the RSA 676-4B, the planning board shall specify by regulation, subdivision and site plan regs, what constitutes a completed application sufficient to invoke jurisdiction to obtain approval. That's a mouthful, but that's basically what the RSAs say is that um, that's what your regulations need to say to the applicants. This is what the town of Meredith requires if you're going to submit a site plan trust. We require all of this. That's why it's in the law. It says shall. You shall specify by regulation what constitutes a completed application, sufficient enough information in order for the board to make a decision. And that's what's considered a complete application. And along with complete application, like I spoke a little bit about in the beginning, are checklists. Checklists, what are they? I talk about checklists all the time. Checklists are what is used as part of the regulations to itemize all types of information that you require for a completed application. So the checklist is the instruction manual, maybe, or it's the cliff notes. This is the, instead of having an applicant go through the entire regulations to figure out what's required of you, the planning board, um, to have a, a sufficient application submitted, you have a checklist. Checklist says, okay, they've got their owner authorization, they have their condominium documents, they have their drainage plan, they have all of the things that you require is on the checklist. So that way that the when that application is submitted across the counter and land use staff or if a board member is the one who's responsible for taking applications in on deadline day, they are looking at that checklist just for submission purposes to see, hey, do they have an abutters list? Do they have all their fees? That's what constitutes the checklist. That is what is a complete application. If, the, if there's a municipality that doesn't have the ability to have staff or to have a board member um, available at deadline day, then um, the boards can do that at, at a public meeting to, to review applications and determine if they're accepted or, or complete. Um, so one thing that you can also do if there's a community that, you know, a community that doesn't have land use staff or a board member that's available on deadline day, uh, you could um, possibly consider doing a conceptual meeting with applicants. Um, that would be, you know, very quick where an applicant could come in and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking of submitting. Um, the board or a board member uh, could say, you know, we still need this, we still need that. So that way the applicant is coming to you with everything that you need to apply instead of having this applicant piecemeal. Oh, you don't have this. Oh, you don't have your drainage. Oh, you don't have your abutters list correct. All those types of things. If it's easier for the board and the applicant um, and the municipal staff, if you have it, to help you with this with planning board application submissions um, to keep everything at, at once. Uh, we do have um, the planning board handbook has a template. I provided the link there. Um, that you can take a look at checklists if you don't have them or if you think maybe your checklist needs to be updated um, please feel free to use that and um, work with again as i always say uh, work with your town attorney about information for um, your checklist so we talk about checklists we talk about um, applications and submissions again a formal application to the planning board is what the board shall specify by regulation what constitutes a completed application sufficient to invoke jurisdiction to obtain an approval that means that you guys have all the information that you want or that you need and what your regulations say in order for you to start making an informed decision and start discussing um, what the application um, is for and and remember, you know, checklists are part of the regulations um, and should be included as part of the application submission. So when you are talking about um, your checklist and you're talking about applications for um, formal applications, uh, you are also, again, as the RSA is required, uh, that your regulations also have waivers. So in the site plan regulations, 674-36, 674-44 discuss is where they discuss waivers. You have to have that relief. And applicants, if the onus is on the applicant, you have a regulation, the applicant, the onus is on them to make the case to you, the planning board, that 
strict enforcement of this recommend this requirement in your regulations is going to cause them a hardship. And I know we use the term hardship, but remember planning board stay in planning board lane and you are reviewing waivers. The waiver uh, definition can include a hardship. That's the waiver is for that hardship. So that's how the planning board works through the waiver process. If the applicant is saying, hey, here's a, an example of a hardship. So I'm doing a, a subdivision and my lot is 500 acres, but I'm only subdividing maybe five acres down here on the bottom. So as, but your subdivision regulations say, in order for a, a subdivision to be considered, you have to survey the whole parcel. Well, I'm going to come to you and say surveying 500 acres is, you know, a huge hardship for me, uh, terrain wise, time wise. So you're going to make the case to the planning board to ask for that requirement to be waived. I'll still have survey at the bottom. There'll still be, you know, legal needs and bounds. But to survey 500 acres is a hardship for me. And that does not go against the spirit and the intent of the regulations. So the board is still going to have a subdivision plan uh, proposal in front of them that has, you know, surveyed lots um, and there's still deed information. So those are the types of things that the board can take into consideration when you're considering a waiver. OK, they should be in writing and they should identify the exact section of the regulations. So if an applicant just says, yeah, I want a waiver from section, you know, 2542 and they don't describe what that is, then the, the onus again is on the applicant to specifically itemize that section of the regulations and then give their justification for it in writing. And when the board is considering a waiver, you need to be very clear um, as to whether you're granting it or not. Make sure your what your reasons are for granting it or not. So a couple of questions that the board can ask when they're considering waivers, and this is part of the acceptance process, okay? So a couple of things to keep in mind. Again, what is the purpose of a checklist? What is the purpose of a waiver? The board can ask, will this affect the information that we need in order for us to hear and decide on this application? Or is there enough information to make an informed decision based on your regulations? So if my scenario with the 500 acre lot, if or can you still make an informed decision about a three lot subdivision out of 500 acre lot total? Because I have three lots, you know, subdivided down at the bottom. There's a surveyed plan. I have access. I have everything down at the bottom. So I'm asking for a waiver. You as the board have make the decision. It's your decision whether or not you say, no, Stephanie, you have to have 500 acres or yes, we feel we're going to grant you this waiver because you can still make a decision based on what's in, um, submitted to you. And if the waiver isn't is granted, then the application is moved forward, accept it as complete, and then you can begin the public hearing. Um, deciding on whether or not an application is complete and open and have a public hearing can be done at the same meeting, as long as it's noticed that way to the public and to um, the abutters. And if it's not accepted as complete, um, if you don't have if the waiver is not granted, then the application can be denied. So make sure for either way, whether you're going to grant a waiver, have your decisions as to why you're going to grant this waiver and and put that into the reasons granted. If the reasons are denied, then make sure that you put in the, the denial for the waiver. The waiver request is not accepted or approved. Make sure your reasons as why are not put into that. And after an application is not accepted because uh, you didn't grant a waiver request, uh, the planning board or staff should work with the applicant to make sure the applicant understands what is expected of them and what they need in order for you to make, um, in order for you to grant that waiver. And as also as well, please make sure that you're working with your town attorney on if you haven't granted a waiver um, and, for, um, and for assistance on helping the applicant. So you've got waivers and checklists for what types of applications. So again, I talked a little bit before in the beginning about major and minor and whether in subdivisions and site plan regulations. So those regulations need to define 
um, the threshold and the descriptions as to what a major site plan is and a major subdivision and a minor subdivision and a minor site plan um, based on you know size of the building, uh, based on square footage, based on number of lots, those types of things are your thresholds. Um, also, the regulations should include if third party engineering review is required for either a major or a minor or for both. Um, if there is an established TRC in your community that has minor site plan review authority, um, then that is takes up that should be in your regulations. The TRC has their own regulations if they have minor site plan review authority, and yet it's based on your thresholds. So make sure that major and minor uh, subdivisions and site plans um, are defined and that uh, thresholds are given. So whether you have land use staff or whether it's a planning board member that is the person who's responsible for taking those applications in off the counter, uh, this is just some information on what can make hopefully your life easier um, when it's deadline day. Deadline day can be you know sometimes very hectic. Um, the number one thing I will say is that when you set your meeting schedule, set your deadlines. Have the deadlines in your application. Have the deadline times in your in your um, regulations. You know, don't allow for 429 drop offs. Don't let somebody come in with an application like this at 429 on deadline day. Um, expect to get it in on time and expect you to process it thoroughly. OK, when I was a town planner, my deadline was noon. My deadline day was noon. That way I had time. I had the rest of the day to organize the applications. If somebody was missing something small, I could call them quickly and say, hey, you forgot to submit me a check, bring it over. Um, you can still work with the applicant and work with people that want you know, the planning board to um, review their applications and you're not doing it at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, make Stephanie, sure you have a... Oh, I'm sorry, Stephanie. Have a question? Sure. Yeah, we did. Uh, there was a one question we'll get to later, but there was a question on my, minor and major site plan review. The question is from Julie. Do you have to have minor and major site plan review components in your regulations? Is that required? Um, components? Well, I don't I don't know what you mean by components, but if you mean like what is the difference? What makes up a major site plan? What makes up a major a minor site plan? Yes, you need to define what those what the guidelines are for that. A major site plan could be anything and whatever that community wants. A major site plan could be anything over 10,000 square feet. A minor site plan could change of use, um, anything on, you know, uh, anything under 5,000 square feet. So those should be spelled out in your regulations. You, you need to make sure your regulations are clear to the public, clear to applicants, clear to the board as to what type of application you are reviewing and what threshold that is. I hope that answers your question. Are there so, a follow up comment that they're saying that they don't define them um, in their in their ordinance, in their regulations? OK, they haven't something, distinguished between OK, two. something to consider. I, I find it easier for boards to work and operate if there is a definition of major and what makes a major and what makes a minor. Uh, it's something to review with your staff or with your town attorney. Uh, but if that's been working for your community, then then that's the way it's been working for your community. So, OK, uh, let's see here. Let's move on to staff application management relatively quickly. Keep these questions coming. We will get to them in the chat. I just want to get through some stuff here. So initially, when it's deadline day, there's a couple of things that can make your life easier. Create a spreadsheet for tracking applications when it was submitted. Um, when I had a first public hearing, when it was approved, all those types of things are very helpful to keep track of the applications, especially if you're getting a lot at one time for one meeting. It's very helpful. Um, it's not really staff, in my opinion, it's not really staff responsibility, municipal staff responsibility or the board member who, who's, who's working on deadline day uh, to verify the, app, the uh, butters for the applicant. You can assist the, but the applicant with uh, butters and where to find the information. But I would not take municipal staff time to do an applicant's job. So make sure that when you one of the first couple of things that you do when you're reviewing an application, that initial review is all of the information necessary. Obviously, a buttered list completeness and inclusion is necessary um, for that application. So a butters are the onus is on the applicant to do that. Work with your town attorney. But that's those that's easier on, on staff and it's the applicant's responsibility. They can verify that the RSA says within five days before the meeting, um, and that is through the town records. But that doesn't mean that you have to do that for them. 
Um, and speaking of a butters, so if you have, uh, I've used thresholds for butter information. Um, I, I learned this a long time ago. The first time that I had a telecommunications wire uh, tower application come in and you have to do a regional notification as well as local notification. Uh, it took me a very long time. Uh, to get all of the butter information uh, ready for that. So I learned to 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 set up uh, 10 abutters or less that the municipal um, municipal staff can do that. Writing out the envelopes, getting all that information together is, you know, is, as long as that applicant submitted the information, labels and things like that, then I could assemble the envelopes. If it's 11 or more, then the applicant should prepare all the envelopes, letters, mailing labels, all that stuff so that um, the municipal staff is not doing the work of the applicant. And also, you know, don't feel it's necessary. You shouldn't be making 15 copies for an applicant. Uh, again, the onus is on the applicant to submit you a complete application. If your regulations say that a complete application includes 15 copies of the application, then the applicant needs to submit that to you. And the application day, again, is not for reviewing the context of material, it's for reviewing the content. Do they have enough information submitted? Um, you can, Dave, of deadline day, inform the chair of um, how many applications you've had, continue processing your fees and escrow fees, and start organizing yourself for, to prepare packets for the planning board and making sure that the planning board at least has about uh, one week uh, to do their homework. So make sure that you're getting those applications out um, one week before the meeting. So one week before the meeting, make sure that the board members have received their packet. Um, you're gonna start working on your templates for minutes and notices of decision. Uh, review the agenda for the chair. The agenda has to be posted, uh, posted 24 hours in advance of the meeting. So if there's any other items that the chair would like to talk about um, at the meeting, that's where it gets put on the agenda. Um, confirm that you have a quorum on the day of the meeting um, and confer, you can confirm if you want if the applicants are attending um, and inform the chair of any changes that may be made to the agenda. Somebody may, all, an applicant may come in, you know, you may get a letter during the day that they wish to continue those types of things. Uh, make sure that you're making the chair aware of that. After the meeting, um, again, if this is the board member or if it's staff that's working with the board, um, it's time for cleanup where you work on your decisions, your minutes, so you have five business days, um, update all your tracking sheets, work on your notices of decision, work with your applicant. These are all types of things that help the applicant through the process, help keep the board organized, that you're following up with the applications and you're doing, it's a lot of administrative work, but the, the, either the board or staff, somebody has to do it. Um, work on finalizing and updating your escrow accounts and finalizing your conditions of approval. So uh, the board's role in this application process, again, your main job is to consider and review and, and approve or deny applications. Um, the chair's role of a meeting is to allow everyone to be heard, the applicant can present, um, a butters and general public can be heard. Uh, the chair is, you know, does not have, he's the one who runs the meeting, okay? They do not have to allow repetitive comments. If someone, if people are getting up and taking up time and saying the same thing over again, um, you can make sure that people are being heard, but that that comment has already been um, expressed and that you agree with it. Uh, the chair can also remind people that comments can be submitted in writing, but it's, it's your responsibility to run the meeting uh, smoothly and timely as, as best you can so you're not running into a four-hour meeting for one application as best you can avoid um, and remain calm and set those time limits as well so repetitive comments and time limits for for people to speak at a meeting is is is, is accepted and should be practiced when see fit for that if you get to a point in in the in the process where you're uncertain of whether or not you can accept an application as complete or not um, there's the board can't make a decision whether or not to grant a waiver or not or missing information. Um, do not be afraid to continue acceptance of that application and speak with your town attorney or speak, you know, speak with your staff about it. When in doubt, don't is what I like to say to my boards. If you're in doubt of, of acceptance, whether you legally can, whether or not you need more information, um, continue acceptance of the application. Um, and make sure that you're utilizing your existing regulations in your decision making process. The master plan is at the top of the food chain for all regulations. That's where everything comes from. That's 
what the community wants, where they want to see development, and your land use regulations are the avenue to get it there. So if your community says we want all Dunkin' Donuts in downtown, we'll make sure that the site plan regulations allow for that and the zoning ordinance allows for that. That's that's kind of how the system should work. So if the board does have a responsibility to make sure that what you're approving and what's coming in front of you um, is in line at some point with the master plan. So you're ready to make a decision. So you need a motion. The motions can be made by any regular board member, including the chair. Um, an alternate can also make um, a motion if they're serving in, in the place of an absent regular member. Uh, the motion should be should contain what you've decided, the, all the conditions of approval or your reasons for denial. Uh, when you make a motion, um, I make a motion that I'm going to approve Dunkin' Donuts located at such and such, and then I need a second. And then that's when you deliberate and you can discuss what your conditions of approval are. Um, and then there's a required vote. So a failed motion, and sometimes boards can run into this, where I make a motion and it doesn't get the majority of, you know, in favors. So that, that doesn't mean that the application is denied or that they're reversed of the, or the, the um, it's not an opposite action. That just means that it was a failed motion. So then another motion needs to be made in order to get the desired re, you know, answer that you want and work with your town attorney about what to do. If, hey, we can't, this motion, we made through two or three motions, we can't get a motion to approve, um, then make sure that you're talking with your town attorney on that. So if, if a first motion doesn't work to get the approvals that you need, then, you know, we have another motion with language that the board can agree upon. A site walks um, can be a very important and very beneficial part of the process. You can consider doing that at the beginning of the of the process. Um, it is a public meeting, so you must post an agenda. You must take minutes. You have to note, um, identify who was at the site walk and who what what issues were discussed. Um, it denying public access to anyone means that the site walk is off. You cannot deny access. The applicant cannot deny me and a butter uh, to come on their property when they're looking at a site walk or during a site walk. So also another thing to review with your town attorney. Um, it, site walks are, you know, good thing to consider, even if you just drive by them as a board, it's a good thing to get that visualization of what your that proposed development is in for the neighborhood. OK, and make sure you're doing it by yourself. Don't have members, um, you know, going to site walks together. If you show up at the same time, kind of keep your distance, just even if you're not even talking about the plan, the application um, perception is is key. So make sure you're making some effort to do some type of site walk. It's very beneficial for the for the process, um, whether it's by yourself or as a board. Uh, board's role for third party review, I would say yes, yes, yes. Um, the RSAs allow for it, and it's very beneficial for a board, especially when you're talking about um, complex applications, large applications, um, new technology applications, so to speak. It's something that's never been done here before. Um, anything that's phased, a third party engineering review can help with that about what the board should be looking for and expect during a phased development. Um, it, it's where it's someone, it's an expert in that field working on the town's behalf. So don't really necessarily always take the developer's engineer's word for it, um, especially when it comes to roads or drainage or traffic or anything like that. Um, all third party reviews by law are required to be paid for by the applicant, so it does not cost the town anything and it's in the town's best interest. Uh, you can work with an engineer um, to get some type of general um, estimate for how much it would cost to go through this process, and then those are the types of things that the applicant would submit. You can also um, consider working with your town attorney as far as getting that process of the third party review. Um, into your regulations. So the role of that expert, again, is to um, develop an improved plan. The, the third party review engineer, surveyor, or expert has your regulations, the applicants on the other side with their idea. If it's necessary, then the applicant and that, eng and that um, engineer can work together because the application will be meeting the purpose and intent of your regulations. 
it, it establishes your basis for an approval or denial. Um, and you can actually also use the town engineer or, or whatever the expert is throughout the whole process, through construction, through inspections, through final inspection, if there's escrow monies to be um, drawn down. All those types of things where you're, the town it has that expert working on their behalf. Third party review um, should be used, you know, it's one of my, it's one of the, one of those things where you should really take advantage of it because it's very beneficial for the town and for the approvals. So you've gone through your site walk, you've, you've had your public hearing. Um, now it's time to consider and, and review the discussion for a proposal for a, of approval or whether or not you're going to deny it. So as a, as a general like courtesy, um, the board can kind of wrap it up. The chair can start saying, you know, last chance for rebutters and for the applicant to speak. Um, that's when you close the public hearing and you begin your deliberations. So that's the time when the board can discuss um, with staff or just with board members um, what potential conditions of approval um, you'll be working on. And it, again, being clear in your conditions of approval and reasons um, is very, very important. And, and I wouldn't get you know bogged down with, oh no, we're giving this guy 20 conditions of approval. That's fine because those conditions of approval are what the board wants. This is what you said, yes, you can build this Dunkin' Donuts downtown, but this is what you have to do to build that Dunkin' Donuts downtown. Um, and remember, you can't enforce intent. You can't enforce what was said at a meeting as easily as what you can say, yes, you didn't meet 15 conditions of approval. If the applicant says at a meeting, oh yeah, the applicant said they were gonna plant a lot of trees and you don't put that in your conditions of approval and it comes down to it and the applicant didn't plant a lot of trees, then that's where you have an issue. So you're better off with more conditions of approval for um, enforcement and for aesthetic and for you know harm, harmonious um, reasons. Um, conditions of approval. So there's a few, there's different terms for conditions of approval and the conditional approval and final approval are different. So don't let people say, oh, we've got a conditional approval. Yes, you have a conditional approval, but that's not final. So you have what's called conditions precedent, which are conditions or items that need to be completed first in order to obtain final approval. So I have approval for my Dunkin' Donuts downtown. A condition uh, precedent would be submit final plans, submit escrows, whatever the board said are conditions precedent. Get your state uh, state permits, all those types of things have to be you know, submitted before you, a final approval can be granted. So a, a conditional approval is not final, okay? You can have um, conditions precedent that can lead to the signing of, a, of the final plan. That's kind of how that process is supposed to work, that the plan is finalized when those conditions um, precedent are met. Conditions subsequent are conditions that are kind of like the life of the of the development. Okay, I'm my Dunkin' Donuts in downtown. I have to turn off my parking lot lights at 10 o'clock at night. Okay, that's a condition subsequent, that that runs with the life of that property. You need those for enforcement and you need those for clarity and, and that's what your regulations, um, you know, that's the intent of your regulations. Again, just some, some practice pointers here when you're working with your final answer and your conditions of approval. Be clear what your conditions precedent and what your conditions subsequent are. Um, if, if the board wants the final approval based on the applicant completing the conditions precedent, you need to be clear about that. Okay, and there's also you can consider putting things in your on your templates for decisions that these are these are the main things that are required for every application. That way, all the applicants are being treated fairly and it's an easier way to track um, if the applicant has met all those things and the applicant is aware they need to be painfully aware of what is expected of them in order to reach conditional approval in order to you know get that conditional approval to final approval again when you are you when you're in doubt uh you know consult your town attorney so you've gone through you you're, you're a planning board member now you've been elected or an appointed official you've taken on the duty and the responsibility on behalf of your town 
um, to, to act on applications and be the ones responsible for implementing the goals of the master plan and implementing the goals of the subdivision and the site plan regulations. So um, people have, have asked you to step up or you've stepped up on your own by being elected or appointed. Um, it's important for you to do your homework. You know, come to the meeting prepared, okay? Uh, be fair and unbiased as best you can. Um, you know, it's it's your it, that's what you were there. You're there to be fair and you're there to listen. Um, there may be applications that aren't popular that come in front of you. There may be applications that are that are controversial, that are small, that are large. Um, either way, uh, you need to make sure that you're you're being fair and unbiased as best you can. You may not like the development. You may not be in favor of it personally, but as a board member, it's your job. You can vote against it, but it's your board member. Uh, it's your board uh, member duty to um, be fair about your decisions. Make sure that you're on time, look presentable for, for the planning board meetings. Um, make sure you're working with your staff on ordinances. Um, attendance at the meetings, I mean, it sounds kind of small, but you know, you should attend your meetings. If you signed up and you were elected to be a planning board member, then do the best you can uh, to make as many meetings as you can. But make sure that you're cooperating with other boards. Um, again, these are just kinds of roles of being a planning board member and roles of how to get through the subdivision and site plan process. All of these things are what it takes to be a board member, what the people who elected you expect uh, for you to make decisions. They may not agree with them, um, but that's part of being a planning board member. You can be respectful of your fellow members and of the public when as a planning board member. Uh, I know it's hard. Applications can get very you know, heated. Discussions can get very heated. Um, but but be respectful and, and fair to the public. Uh, make sure you're you're doing some refresher courses with your town attorney on RSA 91A and not have communications um, via you know email. And don't use social um, media to discuss applications. Again, um, as a board member, you're you're supposed to be fair and unbiased. And posting something on Facebook or whatever that you don't like drive-throughs in your town. Um, is opening up your your town for a lawsuit if there's a drive-through application in front of you. So you need to be mindful of of those types of things. Um, and and again, don't abstain from voting. Um, it, you know, say yes or no. That you you've been put in that position, you've been elected to that position to make decisions. And again, they may not be the most you know uh, favorable decisions or the most liked decisions. But uh, abstaining um, is, is for an application. If you weren't there, then you can abstain. But when when you've been there, you've participated in the process all along. Uh, make sure that you're voting, and make sure that you understand that you can recuse yourself when appropriate. That is, uh, recusals are you know the the final. I have the final say on whether or not I'm going to recuse myself from an application. Uh, but there's some things that you need to remember as a board member when you're reviewing applications and when you're going through this process um, that if there's a, you know, perception can can sometimes be troublesome. So even if there is, if you know, a perception that you have a conflict of interest, then it may be in your best interest to recuse yourself. Um, I understand small towns, everybody knows each other, um, make it aware at the beginning of the hearing or the beginning of the meeting that, hey, I used to work for this guy 15 years ago, um, offer it up to the board. Um, but again, the final decision of whether or not to recuse yourself um, is up to you. Now, I'm sure that uh, board members are aware of some of these terms in the planning world when you've heard of NIMBYs and YIMBYs. Uh, there's other terms that you may um, not have been aware of, but you may hear every now and again. A banana is someone who says build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. So you don't really want to be a banana, but um, these are just some terms that, you know, you can be aware of as you're reviewing um, applications. A dude is a developer under delusions of entitlement. So uh, just be aware um, and be on the lookout for those for those types of terms. So thank you very much. Um, we can get to the chat questions now if, if we have any questions in the chat. And again, you know, pay attention to our website and our uh, planning and development um, training page um, and, and fill out our, our survey. Um, let us know how we're doing and if there's any topics you'd like to see in the future. So yes, Stephanie, we do have um, a number of questions. Um, first from Stephanie uh, 
H that says, my board thinks that it can't talk about a proposal before accepting the plan is substantially complete. This results in us often accepting a plan that does not have full documentation. For example, an easement that is on the title has not been accounted for. Is it correct that we can talk about it to request further documentation, but not open the public session? Um, I would say, you know, yes, it is. And that's a really good question is exactly how that's phrased to propose to your town attorney. And that again, if if that easement is something that if so an application comes in front of me and there's easements shown on the plan, but I don't have the documentation, um, the planning board can say, well, we need to know what this easement says. And, you know, you could accept and based on, you know, you could say, okay, well, accept is complete, but we need this documentation at the next meeting. You could give the applicant a little bit of a deadline, a little bit of a wiggle room there. Um, but that's kind of a good example is that if an easement is shown on a plan, um, but there's no document to, to describe what that easement, you know, says, then, you know, yeah, that could be something, in my opinion, my non-legal planner opinion, that is something that could be um, continue that acceptance until you get the information that you want. But again, you need to verify the board's policy with your town attorney, and they're the ones who are defending you. Great. There's a comment from uh, Andrew Bodnerick that says, going back to the minor and major site plan review question of specifying the different requirements in the checklist. I think that was just a comment. Um, a question from Ann Cunningham. Uh, we're having a great difficulty finding a third party reviewer. Any ideas on how to find one? Um, you could put out, I don't know what, you, what you've been using or doing, but you can certainly put out an RFP. Um, you can reach out to NHMA. They have classified um, section there in, on their website where you can advertise for that and have a, 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 you know, a committee that can review. Um, I've, I've worked with and know communities that have different engineers for different types of applications. Um, but I guess the, the one thing I would do is put out like a search committee, have the planning board or other staff members um, get together and decide what you want. What type of engineer are you looking for? Are you looking for all full time? Are you looking for just certain applications and put out an RFP request for proposals or qualifications, however you want to say it. Great. And another question uh, from Ann is the board required to obtain the applicant's approval of the expert and the cost of the expert of the third party reviewer? Is the board required to obtain the applicant's approval of the expert and the cost of? Um, I don't know if they're required. And that may be a little bit of a nuance to ask your town attorney. Um, I mean, they, as a courtesy, they, they could be involved, but I'm, I'm not sure that the applicant, you're kind of getting into the dog wagging the tail there, which in my opinion right now kind of could defeat the purpose. Um, but you, you can certainly, um, you know, work with your applicant on that. If, you know, if they have an issue with an engineer specific, you need to figure out why. Um, but I, I don't like that term, the, the board required to obtain the applicant's approval over an, uh, an expert that's going to be working on behalf of the town. But that's a little, it should be a little bit more the town's expert that the applicant has to work with. Just my opinion, but work that out with your town attorney if, it, if it's an issue. And great. And there's a request from Joanne Carr to please discuss findings of fact prior to the notice of decision being issued. Findings of fact, meaning the recent the the RSA update a few years ago. I Is believe that what, that's what the question, yeah. what the comment was about. Okay, so that's that's that. yeah, that's and you know you know chime in yourself um, for the findings of fact um, you know questions here. You know I'll punt and say work with your town attorney. Uh, but your findings of fact are, are, are should be based on how this application is meeting your regulations. And, uh, yeah, and, yep. And, and, and I would just add that it's, it applies now to both approvals and disapprovals mm -hmm. um, or, or even or approvals with conditions. Um, and um, again, as I think we put out in one of our, our guidance document two years ago that we authored with NHMA, um, Obviously, depending on the complexity of the application and whether it's a uh, non-controversial application or not, um, you kind of use your judgment in terms of how many details really need to go into the findings of fact, whether it has a right. chance of being appealed or not as such. Right. And I, and I think kind of the goal of that, because, the, you know, the, the, the legislature didn't want planning boards to say, we deny you because, you know, we approve you because. 
So when you get to that findings of fact, you, you know, it, it's a, it, it may be considered a little bit redundant, but it, it should kind of, you know, be um, in conjunction with your conditions of approval. The conditions of approval are kind of, you know, at the end, you're, we're approving you and this is what you have to do. But the findings are fact are like, yes, you know, we feel this, you know, you meet this requirement, you meet this regulation, you know, meet this if, if part of our regulations. Again, things to review with your town attorney. You should be, have a work session with your town attorney and, and go over these types of things. Um, they're the ones that have to defend you and they're the ones that can help you, you know, figure that out. Maybe a template, you know, work with your town attorney to get a template together for the planning board as, for the findings of fact, that may be very helpful. Again, that way everyone is being, you know, con considered the same. Um, all, they're all considerations are across the board for every applicant when you go through your findings of fact. Great. Uh, question from Jessica Call. When exactly does the 30 day appeal period begin? Is it after receiving conditional approval or final approval? According to the RSAs, the 30 day appeal period begins the day after the decision was made. It's the decision. So if my planning board met last night and we decided to approve something, the 30 day appeal period begins today. Great. Uh, there was a question about slides. I put the link to the slides uh, here. They're already on our website. You. Uh, you should be receiving well, should be receiving a follow up email as well with that, um, as well as the recording link. Um, when scheduling this is from Kathy uh, uh, DeRoges, when scheduling a public hearing to update site plan revisions, do we need to post a notice in a newspaper in addition to public places and online? Yes. So if you're going to, you can update your subdivision site plan regulations, your excavation regulations, anything, any regulation, non-zoning ordinance, you can update any time of the year. It just needs your, it needs the 10 day public notice, just like you'd be hearing an application. So whatever your regulations say, um, what, where you post and what the RSA say for where you post things. So if you're still, if you're doing a newspaper in two places in the public and your website, then yes. Doesn't have to be noticed to the, to um, direct butters, it has to be noticed to the public. So that could be newspapers, website, two public places, one or two public places. Great, and I think that was it. That was the last question. You're punting on the findings of fact, yeah. <laughs> I see that, yeah. It's it's tricky, it was confusing when the RSA came out. Um, you know, like, like Noah said, like two years ago and, and our office and NHMA uh, worked on, um, you know, trying to navigate that. So jump on NHMA's website. No, I think we have that on our website as well, don't we? The, 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 the our, guidance. Um, yeah, the yeah guide. and, and, and I believe we do have some additional language and guidance and maybe even a template in our planning board handbook um, yeah. as well. It doesn't say, you know, I know folks wanted a, these are the findings of fact to include, but at least to kind of document a form for how to kind of document it out and how to kind of break information up. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I can't encourage enough for um, for planning boards if you if you don't have staff or for you know staff for planning boards, uh, really you know have a good relationship with your town attorney. And if if any municipality out there you know is giving you a hard time about the cost of a town attorney, just give them my phone number, okay? Because uh, working with your town attorney and having your board make legal sound decisions on their procedures on how they're operating, on, on the decisions that they make. Um, it's extremely important, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure um, that comes to lawsuits. If the, if the planning board innocently made a mistake on, on a findings of fact, you know, because they didn't have much guidance or for whatever the case is, next thing you know, you have a lawsuit or the threatening of a lawsuit, which is stressful and expensive and time consuming. Um, consider having work sessions with your town attorney. That um, it's, it's very important. Go through, make a list of what you want to talk to them about. Um, and have work sessions with your town attorneys, municipal attorneys. And uh, we did get one more point, and I think Lisa is correct here. She said, planning board does not require notifications in papers anymore. Mm -hmm. Correct, ZBA still does only two places and website counts as one. Yeah. Um, and there, there actually was a bill this year to try to change the language for ZBAs as well, which um, unfortunately uh, has, has died this year. Um, yeah. Yep. So ZBAs are still required in the newspaper, but yes, it, that's again. It, it and you know if you look into the you know the other additional writings in the fine print, it's also what your subdivision regulations say. So it actually kind of brings up a good point, Lisa, that um, if your subdivisions you know say 
you have to post in a newspaper of genuine circulation and the RSA has changed and you're not doing that anymore because the RSA changed, we got to make sure that your subdivisions match that. So um, again, work sessions once a year, a few times a year, go through your regulations and make sure everything in your regulations is up to date with the RSAs. So we've we've run a little bit over. Um, just last, I can, you know, if everyone doesn't mind, I could take a few more questions uh, before we wrap it up. But again, thank you for your attendance. Thank you for helping us out today at the beginning when we were trying to figure out, um, you know, the changes to teams. So we've been used to one system and they change it. And, and now we're trying to get used to another system. Um, and, and check out our website if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to give me a call. My email is there as well. Um, our planning and zoning training page has our, our tests. It has the update for our planning board zoning books. Um, and we're interested in, in your feedback and your comments. So if you have the time to please participate in our anonymous survey. And I see Andrew. Andrew must have attended uh, one or two of my trainings um, in the past when you cross check your definitions and all regulations. Absolutely. That's what you should be doing with your zoning, your zoning ordinance. Make sure you have a use that matches the definition and a definition that matches the use, um, as well as definitions in your in your zoning ordinance regulations. Good job. And again, thank you for participating in a little quiz at the beginning, and I hope you found it fun, kind of do something a little bit different. And um, thank you very much for attending. Have a good day, everyone.